All right, so welcome back into the live stream today. We're going to continue our portfolio buildup of buying at the bottom, what that might look like. Today, we're going to be drilling into two different token areas. One, of course, is going to be the exchange tokens. What that might mean is there's some exchange tokens out there that would fit in this portfolio. And then also a handful of utility tokens, things that are out there doing work in blockchain and Web3. We'll drill into all of that. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. As you guys know, we've covered this uh, over the past several shows. We've got one more show left to build out our overall token array. And the way that it's being done, just to give you kind of a quick review of how this program is working, I'll show you the slides on this. But basically what we did is we broke it down into a variety of categories, layer ones, twos, metaverse and gaming, uh, exchange tokens, which is today. And then we're also bringing in part six, which is our utility. We've done payment tokens. We've done the NFT, and then we're going to have our audience picks, which is our lineup. So just so you guys understand, audience picks are if there's something that isn't in the list that you like, like in the list today that we're talking about, drop it in the comments below, not in the side chat if you're here on the live. Uh, make sure it's in the comments below so it helps with people after the show. So the idea with this is pretty simple. We're investing 20K in this portfolio. We're going to build it out of 30 token targets. And then we're going to do stack ranking, which simply means we're going to cut the lower 20%. We'll base this on three different metrics. One is our overall power index monthly average score of each token. We'll look at my score. And then this is where you come in. This is the audience score. So we're going to give you guys two polls today. You'll get one on the uh, exchange side and one on the uh, utility side. And then we rank all that and come out with a portfolio at the end to basically go in and invest in. Just to give you a quick rundown uh, layer 1s, we had ADA, AVAX, and SOL that won out uh, there. Our Layer 2s, we added in MATIC and DOT. Then we moved on to our payment tokens, which picked up H HBAR and uh, XRP. And then uh, we moved into our NFT tokens. There's only a handful there. We picked up Engine and OMI. And then now we're, uh, this from our last one, if you caught our show with Hustle, uh, we did our gaming and Metaverse. And from that side, we, we've got Sand, Alluvium, Audio, which is Audius and Axie Infinity. So now we're going to try to pick up a handful of tokens in today's um, video. So I thought, hey, let's bring somebody on that really understands the breakdown of not only how exchanges work, but also reviews a lot of different protocols, ways to save money and utility. And that is Full Value Dan. He's been on our show before. Hey, Dan, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, okay. So Dan, we, we're running a live stream early early today, a little bit outside our norm. Dan's mm -hmm. uh, over in Taiwan, so it's a different time zone, so we're trying to accommodate there. But uh, Dan, let's get into a little bit about your channel real quickly. You, you do a lot of breakdowns. I love your how-to videos. What do you like doing most right now in crypto for YouTube? Uh, I think the how-to videos are the easiest for me because it's a very streamlined process. Whenever I'm doing like a coin review, it, it involves a lot of research and experience where I want to speak as an authority on something. But if it's like, mm -hmm. oh, how to get started in DeFi or this exchange or using this feature, that that's an easier walkthrough for me just because... Uh, all the steps are there instead of yeah. these open-ended things when, you know, as you know, from making like a review, there's a lot of different things to consider. For sure. I like, I like your how-to videos. I, I actually uh, will use them as reference often. Hey, I want to get into uh, the tokens today. We're going to run down just to get everybody on, on the same page with us. This is what we're going to be looking at today, exchanging utility tokens. So we're going to be looking at Binance, BNB, uh, FTX with their FTT token, uh, Crow. Uh, also, the KuCoin token, KCS. We'll look at PancakeSwap, Uniswap uh, on the exchange side. And then we'll also bring in uh, Helium, R-Wave, Chainlink, and Render from our utility side of things. So basically what we're going to uh, drill down is, is let's get into the exchange tokens first. And this is something uh, you and I had a chance to talk in the pre-show. When you look at exchange tokens, Dan, what would be the strategy for you in understanding which kind of tokens you would want, invest in, and maybe look at long-term holds. So out of what you saw there with Binance, FTX, Crow, uh, PancakeSwap, KuCoin, and Uniswap, where do you guys, where do you kind of fall on, on those in terms of popularity for your own portfolios? 
Uh, I would go with the centralized exchange tokens because if you've used PancakeSwap before, they can print an unlimited supply. So that one's out immediately. Uniswap is only for governance, so it doesn't really have a lot of value, but people want that governance so they can kind of control some of the votes for what happens on the platform, which makes sense if you are a hardcore Uniswap user because there are a lot of DeFi features on there. For myself, I love the centralized exchange tokens because even in a bear market, they do well because as long as there's trading volume, that exchange makes money. And if there's trading volume, most of these exchange tokens have buyback and burn systems. So they are continuously adding value to their own token. As for KuCoin, Crow, and BNB, they also have their own DeFi ecosystem. So there is on-chain data for how many transactions there are daily, uh, the user growth, the amount of wallets. And uh, for FTX, I think that one's mostly a exchange-only token. It gives you features for like some of their um, built-in uh, um, value-added uh, features like getting in on initial exchange offerings, uh, exchange discounts, but that's only for FTX.com. So that leaves right. out all the US users US. since they don't have their own DeFi program. So I, I like exchange tokens to a certain extent. I often wonder you know, what the real potential use case is there. Now, obviously there are some tokenomics behind these in some cases, like if you look at BNB, there's a, bon- a burn mechanism that's very, very solid. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also look at the exchanges themselves. If you look at what is happening on Crow, you look at FTX, and what, let's take KuCoin and also Binance in this particular case, uh, staying with the exchange tokens. Is there one of those that you feel more comfortable with? I know here in the U.S. we have a lot of uncertainty around exchanges, so everybody's kind of looking at trying to go to more self-custody. Do you see that as mm-hmm. a trend down the road that could really affect volume uh, in the short term during this bear market? I don't think everybody's ready for self-custody because uh, I'm sure you know people who have lost their keys before or oh, aren't yeah. that tech savvy. So centralized exchanges are going to be here to stay and they really help out the people who are just getting started in crypto. Uh, for myself, I really like what Binance is doing. They're doing a lot of the things on the regulation side. They're expanding it to other countries. They're helping people get involved in crypto. Uh, I like what KuCoin is doing on the side where, you know, there kind of isn't any KYC. A lot of people have access to it. And both of them are building DeFi products. I'm not too involved in crypto.com just because I don't really enjoy using their interface. I, I love a web-based interface. It's just easier for me to jump in and just have everything on there rather than um, going back and forth between my uh, phone and these Mobile. multiple yeah. crypto apps. Yeah. yeah, for sure. We're going to put up a, a poll of the four then on the exchange token. So in the audience, you guys will get a chance to vote on those the way that you see fit and based on your popula- popularity. So again, remember your score, your your rank, that you're giving to it by your vote is going in as a third of our overall score when we rank these tokens out in our portfolio, which will give us our stack ranking. At the end, we'll start publishing the entire portfolio. We'll, then we'll put this up on Coin Market Cap. You guys will be able to follow it uh, and do all that. Back to these uh, exchange tokens. So I, I would agree with you. I like web interfaces. Mobile is cool because in some cases you might need to get to it. Um, If you were looking at these from a web interface side, which one do you feel has the most, I won't say easy for the entry level um, crypto user, but at least we'll we'll call it the beginner to intermediate crypto user. Mm -hmm. How would you rank these exchanges in terms of ease of use? Some of them can be pretty complicated. I would say Binance, well, actually, FTX would be the easiest because they have this thing called the Blockfolio app. So there's no exchange, it's just buy, sell. So that's actually the simplest one. Then they have their more advanced exchanges for FTX.us.com. But that is also in line with Binance. And with Binance, if you are a US user, Binance US, you can do ACH transfers, which makes it easy to get money in and out, FTX as well. Whereas like KuCoin, that's crypto only. So then you kind of already need another account to bring in your money. So 
if you are going to get started, you need something that can easily connect to your bank. And that would be yeah. FTX and Binance. And crypto.com, cool. but you know, no web interface, so it's it's a right. little it's a little more work. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna use these four tokens then. We'll have obviously mm -hmm. FTX, Binance, uh, Crow, and then we'll also use Ku KuCoin in this group. This will be in the poll, so you guys will be able to vote on that. These are the exchange tokens. Uh, we'll drop our Uniswap and our PancakeSwap uh, tokens from this list. Now we'll still keep them in our overall, so we'll rank them in um, everything outside the poll, they'll probably get dropped into our stack rankings. So we'll see how those, those kind of fall out. So when you guys get the poll here, make sure and uh, basically vote on that on the ones that you like and where you might be going with it. All right, last question in the side of the exchange tokens. So ease of use, big factor, because I think popularity on ease of use always drives volume. And if you're driving volume, mm -hmm. you're benefiting the token and the ecosystem there. Mm -hmm. Without that, do you think people are out there in the market that maybe don't even have an FTX account that are actually buying the FTX token? Do you see any people doing that very often without supporting the ecosystem? I, I don't see that very often, um, but some people do like leverage trading. So that would probably fall into that niche where people kind of see the news and what's happening and maybe mm -hmm. they'll they'll do a leverage play against it. But for the regular user, they don't really need that token. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so Dan, when you look at trends here, and obviously we're trying to keep exchange tokens in the in the group overall, do you think this that investing in these exchanges from a token standpoint is a solid investment for long term? How do you see this playing out, say, in the next two to three years, especially into the next bull run? So you also have to look at like which exchanges are still which exchanges are still going to be here in three years, exactly. and those yeah. are typically the the top exchanges now. Going with a smaller exchange is very risky, but with exchanges like uh, Binance, KuCoin, Crypto.com, they've been in the space for several years. They're they're building. They're uh, getting things uh, as far as regulation goes. They're they're just expanding the crypto space. I see them being around for another three years, especially with their token and how they're trying to add value to it with their burns and buybacks. So those would be a solid play even if we stay in a bear market for the next year. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but uh, what does really well in these bear markets consistently are exchange tokens because they have this con continuous revenue. Yeah, I, I would agree with that for sure. And there's a handful, you know, when you're when you are a customer of one of these exchanges, even if you're doing self custody, because we have a lot of people that do self custody on our channel. Mm -hmm. Even if you're doing self custody, maybe you're doing an in app trade or a swap like with FTX on the ledger, or you're just moving your tokens in and out and you're carrying USDC or Tether or whatever it might be in terms of your trading asset to go over to exchanges. Uh, I think a lot of people will will start to look at these in terms of potential investment. Finance has been a little bit tough here in the U.S. because their onboarding has been so slow for U.S. customers, and they've almost heard, made yeah. It, yeah they've almost made it impossible for entities to get in because of the KYC. I've never seen an entity registration and KYC that has been this stringent. I mean, the things they ask for is like it's crazy, like bank statements, pictures of uh, verification of utility bills. And I'm like, this is just, how would they ever scale <laughs> if you continue yeah, to put those I, kind I, of gates up? I, I, I'm kind of in the conspiracy mindset here where banks want to make it as hard as possible for <laughs> people to move their money out of the bank and into crypto. Mm -hmm. So that potentially might be why. Now, Binance US is a different entity from Binance.com. So there is kind of a different system there where they have their own customer service teams and uh, right. uh, just overall uh, system. So that's why uh, there is a huge difference in quality because uh, if you do have access to Binance.com, you know that the experience is drastically different. Yeah. And, you know, with Binance here, at least in the U.S., you have a very limited supply of tokens, too, that you can access versus what you get with Binance being yeah. outside the United States. So that's another factor. As far as Crypto.com, I've been in and out of those. Uh, it's not one of my favorite exchanges, but I've used it. Um, one thing that I was always, uh, and, I, and I'm always cognizant of, is that when change, changes start happening within exchanges, especially on withdrawal limits, I get a little spooked. 
And whenever I mm -hmm. see that happen, or I see mass reductions in yields, uh, which has been the factor with you know crypto.com, which they used to have massive yields, and then they've of course been backing that off. Maybe in a precursor to this tidal wave of of yield e explosions that we've seen with Voyager and Celsius. Uh, as far as KuCoin, I mean, you know, again, it's kind of a, a little bit of a free for all in KuCoin. You've got so much flexibility, mm -hmm. um, but again, it's one of those one of those projects that I'm just not a huge. I am a big fan of FTX, but again, with FTX, I feel like it's still to me not the perfect exchange. Again. Limits for me uh, are still a big issue with FTX, and I like the, you know the one that I like is, is and had recently launched here. They don't have they're not on the list here today, but and they don't have a token. Is Pinex uh, US uh, launch? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I use them too. It's, yeah, it's a great product, um, and I like the US they side of it. They have a lot of coins. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they got a lot of. Well, you're you're essentially living on the Binance, the Binance ecosystem there, so. It mm -hmm. seems to work pretty well. Let's get into utility. We'll jump back over here to the list real quick. So we're going to take a look at Helium, Arweave, Chainlink, and Render today. As you guys know, we've covered Helium. We've covered Arweave uh, to a certain extent here, and then obviously Chainlink and Render. Render is one of my favorites, Dan, uh, just because I think the future of how graphics, metaverse, and utility will be uh, used in the future of rendering all things digital the potential for mm -hmm. a decentralized kind of uh, AWS of graphics and rendering, I feel like has a good place in the blockchain and Web3 community. When you look at those tokens, um, Helium, Arweave, Chainlink, Render, we're going to put a poll up for those as well, guys, so you'll get a chance to vote on those. Which one of those do you like more, more so than others? I like Chainlink the most, but I'd also like to talk about uh, Helium and Render. So okay. Helium, you know, everyone is mining, they're getting tokens, but on the other side of that, like, it doesn't seem like many people are using the network. They don't really make that data easily accessible. So the demand is kind of unknown. I know they're, they are moving into 5G and they're creating all these other services, but it's just trying to understand, like, is there a demand for this? Now with Render, I, I actually used to work with Disney. I was part of kind of their encoding team where we would have to render things. And, you know, there was a lot of secure data uh, when it came to the files because we were working on like Marvel movies, all things Disney related. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to take probably a decade for um, that transition to happen because, you know, they trust AWS, their vendors trust AWS. Yeah. So the people using render would probably be small um, developers, uh, people creating things on a smaller scale as that trust builds and uh, they could possibly onboard bigger clients like studios. Now that transition might take a while to happen, um, but it is possible. But at the, mo at the moment, I think the run up to that will will be several years. So that one, uh, you know, for immediate investing might be a little riskier with yeah. the Chainlink. They have consistent demand. They are the most popular um, one in their space as far as data oracles. They've upgraded to creating these uh, oracles that can enact uh, smart contract actions which kind of means that if you were in DeFi, you could have a limit order. So we saw USTD peg if you had a Chainlink Oracle with the smart contracts added to it. If you saw the depegging of any coin, you could start market selling any of the coins you have in your portfolio. And that kind of opens up a lot of new options to the DeFi world with what we can do now. Yeah, there's a big uh, community around Chainlink. I want to get into all of those, but I want to jump to our poll real quick to see how our results are on the first side of things and uh, let's take a look. All right, so Binance uh, right out there on top at 38% and wow, Crow comes in number two at 29%. I'm surprised that FTX was kind of third place here. That's interesting. Uh, but, you know, all right, so that's perfect, guys. Thank you so much for, you know, mm -hmm. jumping on that. We'll keep that poll up there so you guys will be able to get a chance to still vote on that. We'll also put the ones up on the utility tokens here so you'll get a chance to jump in on those. I want to jump back to Helium for a second. So Helium has been one we covered here on the channel. They got into their HIP 52 and their 53 uh, bridge, which is kind of this whole new um, era of how they're trying to get into 5G. And in, if you look at Helium, mm -hmm. it has mostly been an IoT network, meaning 
very low latency kind of data, you know, everything from atomic clocks to air conditioning systems that are operating in a lot of municipality kind of stuff. I never really felt like that was a big use case where I felt that this mm -hmm. could really scale is if they really brought uh, broadband, you know, to a larger yeah. community. And because it's been one of those things, at least here in the U.S., I know. I'm kind of curious, in, in Taiwan, do you have open broadband networks in public places? Um. I think the 5G is just so good here that it, it doesn't yeah, really it. matter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then the internet connections at home um, can be up to like one gigabit, so it, it's really fast. Well, you just hit on something right there that I think is the failing point. The only scenario that I think is the future for Helium is going to be uh, utilizing kind of the IoT side of 5G. And what I mean by that, it's not mm -hmm. general open network for you and your mobile device or your laptop. It's how uh, systems, architectures uh, within, you know, just everyday life are communicating to kind of phoning home that don't have necessarily the capability to bring in broadband or a line or fiber or any of those kind of things. So that'll mm -hmm. be interesting to see if that can scale. But I will say this. We have tried helium miners here in our studio. It's a little clunky. You really have to be super technical to get these things mm -hmm. to work at any scale level. And it has been a little bit of a challenge there. So I think it, when you think about Helium, uh, to kind of just remember those things. As far as, um, as far as render, here's my thinking with render, is that while I would agree with you, is that it's probably gonna take some time to really build out, I think that render is gonna get soaked up by somebody, meaning, just because of the technology and what they're trying to do at some point, somebody, whether it's a studio or a big uh, motion picture or something within the media and entertainment business that requires something like this, maybe gaming, uh, that could ba basically come in and uh, maybe merge or and or grab render as an asset. And at that point, I think obviously who knows what will happen there, but it could could be valuable for the token side. And That's then, true. Isn't J.J. Abrams a, an investor or like is, a key yeah. person in their team? And yep. he does have his own studio, so it's kind of like he has to bring in more. He has to, you know, he's the proof of concept. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the cool one, cool aspect. If you see any kind of signs that Render starts making studio deals, or we see things mm -hmm. like what we saw this week with Polygon and Disney, those are yeah. those are definite you know, pebbles in the sand to watch because that will guide your path on where these some of these projects are going. Let's get to the other two on this list. And that, of course, is um, Arweave. Uh, well, actually, we talked about Chainlink, and I would agree with you. I think Chainlink, Chainlink's community, by the way, is absolutely crazy. I mean, it's a very big community. So if you count that, most likely Chainlink is going to be at the top of the list. But what about Arweave? What are your, what are your thoughts on Arweave? So Arweave is decentralized storage. Um, the only problem is there are a lot of competitors in the space. You know, there's like Filecoin, there's StoreJ. Um, I know there's a lot. I just can't name them off the top of my head. Now, Arweave does have some big partnerships, but I think their biggest challenge is, you know, getting these people to actually use the decentralized storage because they're being used for NFTs mostly, maybe some IPF storage for some Web3 stuff. But for the regular user to use Arweave, it's very, very difficult. I tried to use it. I needed help and I, I still didn't get that help. So I kind of gave up on it. So getting started and involved in some of these decentralized storage solutions are pretty difficult when compared to Google Drive, which is super yeah. easy to use. And, you know, for the regular user, 15 gigs is more than enough. And if you mm -hmm. need more, you just make another Google account. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the question is will and can they overtake someone like AWS? I think you're right in the sense that I'm still a big fan of Arweave. I like the theory behind mm -hmm. what they're trying to do. They also just launched their new program. It's called Arweave, introducing an experimental new SmartWeave token model. There's some interesting things here within it. So it basically, it's trying to um, offer a platform for an indefinite storage of data. So that in itself would be good to developers, especially for Web3. Mm -hmm. Now, he hear me out on this one. So you've got AWS sitting over here with the regular tech stack for Web2. 
Then you have Web3 and all of blockchain developing now. Different protocols, from Solidity, Rust, you name it. All these guys are building, building, building. And they're traditionally having to go back to Web2 storage mm -hmm. you know, capacity. So if there is a potential for any kind of Web3 integration down the road, at some point, Amazon either has to do it, or Rackspace has to do it, or our weave slides in and becomes maybe the AWS of Web3. That's my theory behind uh, our weave. But again, you're talking about Amazon who could literally pull the plug and put a billion dollars behind this in a matter of minutes and could become a huge, you know, a huge competitor in Web3, especially around data storage and data science overall, because I think we'll see a lot of that. What are your thoughts on Web3 mm -hmm. and the growth right now? Because it's still a very nascent market do you think we'll see 2x, 3x growth in the next few years? I think that's very possible, but it depends on the products and how users react to the products because there are a lot of things available now. Um, it's just getting users for it. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, Web3 based social media sites, but people are already on Twitter. They get all their news there, they, all their friends on, are on there they're not going to switch over. So it's kind of like you can't, you have to build on top of the spaces where the, the users are already there. So yeah. it's, I guess it's the strategy of uh, building and getting these products into the hands of other people. And incentives work up until a point, but it just has to be a really good product so people continue to use it. Like Uniswap, that's a great product. People continue to use it. And uh, at first it was new. People kind of didn't trust it. But uh, over time it, it did well. And the Web3 space and it blowing up, I think will have a same effect. Um, user growth will be very slow at first. But if uh, something is built that people like, it could do well. Now, as far as the things that are unique in the Web3 space, there aren't a lot of unique things. There's a lot of overlapping products, a lot of things that are very similar. So it's just trying to find something that really stands out. Yeah. I look at it this way in the sense of Web3. If you, if you go back to the birth of the internet in really the mid 90s and kind of that emergence of what we had in the dot bomb era, you know, I was a young engineer at that time, working with Microsoft, doing a lot of stuff, understanding how the, the infrastructure was being built for at that time, HTTP and really the birth of, of what we know as the modern internet. And I, I look at what's happening now to have a lot of similarities. And the reason I think this is very important is because of this scalability of addresses, smart contracts, is, uh, smart contracts obviously all the scan platforms, uh, scan platforms when you look at Etherscan, all the different token scans mm -hmm. out there in terms of tracking uh, you know, overall transactions itself. But I think NFTs, are the, are the canary in the coal mine. Because when you look at NFTs and the potential, it reminds me of like DNS when it was created. Because when you had to start creating mm -hmm. real, real DNS architecture to build websites, so everybody had a, a website address, that's where I see the future of smart contracts is that the NFT side of things is gonna absolutely explode. Obviously we've seen the .eth domains and all that functionality on like Unstoppable and those guys. I think we're going to see a big move in that area. Now, that's where I think an R-Weave would be interesting, at least. And they kind of talk about it with this Smart Weave uh, article here. They're kind of talking about NFTs that uh, could be kind of the explosion point when you've got all these different uh, platforms. And much like websites, think of this, Dan, how many mm -hmm. places in, you know, overall on the internet, you know, billions of websites out there, the potential, I think, are maybe two, maybe 10x of what we could see on NFTs, especially if we get down into making it easy for an average person to create an NFT for anything, you know, tokenizing the world, as they say it. Raul Powell talks about mm -hmm. that a lot about tokenizing the world. But anyway, I want to get to our, our um, poll. I know you guys have uh, your ideas. Let's see what, what comes up here. All right, so we've got Helium. Yeah. Our, Helium. Yeah, there you go. Chainlink wins. I like that one. Woo. You were right on, Dan. There you go. Okay, you know the audience. That's good. I mean, I like I'm that. also invested in that one, but uh, <laughs> I saw what they were doing, and then I was like, I, I'm investing now. Yeah. 
Before I, like I was it. like, I, I was like, all right, there's a lot of different oracles that can provide services, but you know, they're the front runner. They're consistently evolving, and they have the most market share. I think they do like a nine over ninety percent of uh, the data oracle stuff uh, for crypto companies or crypto projects. Yeah. Very cool. All right, we're going to wrap it up today. We'll take a couple of questions, but I want to get your uh, input, Dan. What do you think is the most important thing right now within Web3, blockchain, crypto in general, that has to happen from a global adoption level? Do you think it's onboarding? Do you think it is making it easier for the average person to understand it? What are, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's security. It's like so many bad things happened this year that yeah. there is little trust in it. If people don't trust it, they won't get involved. So yeah. I think we need just different ways for our own wallets and where we're holding things to be more secure, more transparent um, before more people get involved. Yeah, for sure. Let's take a couple of questions. Uh, all right, looks like uh, Rob is in the house. Good point. We need things easier for mass adoption and security. Talking about that, uh, I like it. Crypto Steve, uh, there's difference between um, there is a difference between a token having great utility, vice, uh, vice demand, and having a purchase token. Uh, Chainlink and most utility tokens have demand problems. Uh, what retailer needs to purchase Link? Yeah, I guess that would be a question on none of them. Yeah. All, all the developers that are using their data oracle services, any of these Web3 platforms that want to use data oracles, any of these DeFi protocols that are getting their pricing data, they all have to use the link token. So there yeah. is a lot of demand for it. So demand is more from the, the inner workings of how the ecosystem mm -hmm. works versus what, we, what you guys might see as, as retail. Um, wasn't our, our weave a potential candidate for ETH data storage? I don't know if that was uh, the fact. Did you hear anything? Were they? Looks like the, the pit I, is saying yes. I'm not yes. familiar about with that, yeah. Yeah, the, the pit is saying yes. Uh, Terry Ball, uh, our weave is a legit um, definition of future proof when blockchain gets to huge. I would agree there. That's my point. I think that we mm -hmm. do get to a point where we could overtake what we know as the modern internet. You know, especially just because there's so much potential for things mm -hmm. that have never really made it into the world of the World Wide Web, you know, that never really made it because of security issues, yeah. traceability, all that. My, my only concern is like there are a lot of decentralized storage competitors. So it's kind of like the early days with like Ask Jeeves, yeah. Web Crawlers, like which Who one wins? is going to be the, the top dog? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point, too, because there were a ton of really early mm -hmm. uh, web crawlers out there for sure. I mean, if anybody knows, Alta Vista was the precursor to yeah. Google before Google became the beast. Uh, Qu uh, Quant, let's talk about this. Thoughts on the SEC possibly targeting utility coins. What are your thoughts there? Obviously, we see a lot of, almost everything's going to fall into the SEC side of things as securities. What are your thoughts on how all this is laying out, Dan? Well, I think utility tokens are harder to target just because they have a utility. You can kind of say uh, there are existing utility tokens like at a video game arcade. They sell you a utility token for you to play their game and it's right. like a one-to-one -one exchange. So the utility tokens kind of have that free pass. It's not necessarily an investment product, but if there is demand, that's where the price goes up. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Benny, uh, can crypto mining be an alternative way to uh, become st get steady income in the bear market? I think mining now is so, uh, it, just the problem solving is so great. And the amount of equipment and power that you need to run and really mine on Bitcoin is pretty insane right now. Yeah, it's uh, not that profitable. So there's a lot of miners for sale. I was actually looking into this because some of the top miners after electricity costs are making like $2 a day with this huge upfront investment. So yeah. it's possible if, uh, you know, long term, yes, it, it will do well. But the upfront investment right now is a little too high because your ROI might take several years if the price doesn't come back up. Yeah, and hash rate is getting much more difficult, obviously, as we get into mm -hmm. the next happening. So it's only going to be more powerful, uh, more power required in terms of the processors and uh, graphic cards to do it. Gonzo, is Crow ever going to be as big as BNB is for fi uh, Binance? I, I don't Not think so. Like, yeah. 
uh, BNB, they do uh, like five times more transactions daily than Ethereum. They're like the yeah. top dog. And I think Crow does like a small fraction of what ETH is already doing. So if you kind of compare the market caps and how ingrained BNB is into so many different protocols, that uh, BNB would just have to stop working for several years for Crow to catch up. <laughs> not going to happen. CZ is not going to let that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, BNB. And BNB mm -hmm. is such a utility for me. I use it for everything. You always keep it. It's like cash around. You know, you have to have it occasionally to run transactions. Mm -hmm. And then if you are investing in it, it also holds very stable even in bear markets. I kind of compare it a little bit to ETH. In uh, the mm -hmm. way I invest in it, I'm full disclosure, I invest in and hold BNB for that very reason. So it's definitely one of my long-term tokens uh, for sure. All right, Dan, it's been great having you on the show this time. It's been uh, been fun breaking all this down. Uh, if you guys want to check out Dan's channel, just go Full Value Dan. You will get a plethora of information and education. So thanks again for stopping in. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You bet. All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast side of things. Maybe you're catching this after our live stream. This is unusual. We don't normally do a live stream this early, so I know the audience was a little bit lower, but um, the key here was we wanted to make sure and get this part of our portfolio buildup done. We've got one more, uh, one more component, and that's going to be our audience uh, choice. And the audience choice, we've got a few in there. We've got Algorand in there, a handful of others that if we have not included a token, uh, in the list for you, then make sure. And I'm going to put a list out on Twitter. So if you'll follow me at Paul Barron, I'll put a full list of the tokens that we've done so far and so far how things are lining up in terms of the percentage. Uh, and I'll keep you updated on that. And then we'll wrap up on our final episode uh, next week on this series. And you'll get a chance to build out a, a buying at the bottom portfolio with us. We're going to put 20 10K is going to go in Bitcoin and ETH. 10K is going to go in all this group right there. Make sure, and of course, hit me up on Twitter out there at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.